I believe it or not, by profession I am a chemical engineer, who worked all my life in production, machines and everything, but I always loved history, and now retired, it's a passion, it's my hobby today. That's what I do, in addition to cooking and baking. <laughs> <laughs> this presentation is an adaptation of one that I gave three years ago at St. Joseph's Church. St. Joseph's Church celebrated three years ago the 250 jubileum of the oldest Catholic community in all New Jersey. And I was invited to make this presentation, so I adapted it for tonight. And that's what I will be presenting. Because yeah. Milford didn't exist at that time. It was open land. There was no town, city, I met, just impossible to imagine. There was no town. There were only a couple of farmers living at that time and going to their farms. The people that arrived, they started really from scratch, from zero because there was nothing. There were no roads, there were no stores, nothing. So they had really to complete everything that they needed to. Transportation was very difficult at the time, but they achieved, and that's one of the reasons was we for this year today. I will concentrate myself practically from 1764 and four or five years after that. I'm not going to go into the whole history of West Milford, of the Highlands, etc. I'm going to concentrate. The people that arrived, what did they found? What did they have to construct in order to be living? Let us back, go back to 1760. Yes. To we cannot remember, the, not forget that there was no electricity. Of course, there were no cameras, so there are no pictures, no photos. What they, we have are only paintings, engravings, some sketches. There was no tap water. Of course, there was no gas. So the furnace had to run on charcoal. Gasoline for transportation. Impossible, but what they were using is transportation with horses, mules, donkeys, whatever they had there. Important what I said about the cameras and the drawings and sketches. It was difficult to find something really trying to see how it was here 250 years ago. Why? If you go to many of the books that you find, every time that speak about colonial times, mostly the pictures that you find of the people are pilgrims with the type of uh, clothing that they were used to, to wear. Uh, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but it's not really the right word, they were tip top clean always. And I don't estimate, I don't believe that at that time, that was the way they were living here in the Highlands. So it was difficult for me sometimes to find illustrations to show you what I think it was at that time. But why did I choose 250 years ago? It's not because of St. Joseph. St. Joseph would be, we could consider it as a, a secondary effect of what happened 250 years ago. In June 1764, Peter Hasenkeller, a German that had a company together with English partners, arrived here to establish Iron Works in North Jersey. He during his time that he was in Europe, had the opportunity to meet many of the sailors in the cities of Lisbon and in Cadiz, Spain, about how rich 
America was in land, in rivers for transportation, in wood, forests to make later charcoal, and iron ore. And England at that time, he became English because he was married to an English lady. England was importing steel and iron, and iron from Russia, from Sweden, because in England at that time they were running out of woods to make charcoal in order to produce iron. So he came to the idea, why don't we try to do that in America? And you know in America, the British government didn't permit many things to be done here. Why? Because they wanted everything that was consumed in America should come from England. They wanted the money that the people pay back, and they wanted that everything consumed here was from, um, from England. At the end, they gave him permission because they were run, running out of money. And out of money because they were paying a lot to some countries that in occasionally were not their enemies. They got out of the station. But the important thing about Hassan is, he arrived here when there was practically nothing, only a couple of farmers. In three years, he built a Charlottenburg, all those constructions and the furnaces. Charlottenburg is where today the Charlottenburg Reservoir is, Route 23 and Echo Lake at the end. It's now underwater. He built also forges, and at Long Pond, not far away here, just before crossing into Ringwood and the Monson Reservoir, he built also a lot of constructions, houses for all the people that were living here. The important thing of Hasselkleber was that he practically in three years established self-sufficient communities. Communities that were able to survive in this area because transportation was practically non-existing. But inside what is today West Milford, he built many, many miles of roads, dams to increase the volume of the reservoirs of the lakes. One of those was Lompoc, today Greenwood Lake. The size that Greenwood Lake has today was Originally created by Hassan Kedder with his original dam. He arrived on June the 4th and bought a little further at Rainwood Manor. But there was not enough water there, and that's the reason then he established Charlottenburg. We then today we say Charlottesburg. It was Charlotte because it was Charlotte the Queen of England, the spouse of George III, and she was partner of Castle Clever also in this enterprise. Where were they? Okay, I mentioned that to you already. It was here at the Greenwood Lake. That was the original name was Longford, Charlottenburg, and also here at the river that were the Three uh, uh, iron works also in this area. And you cannot read it here because here it says German Town Road and the little church that's in St. Joseph Church. Those were really communities, and the problem was that there were no skilled workers here to make charcoal, to go mining, and to operate furnaces and forges. So he brought with him over 550 Germans and a couple of Irish because those Germans went to England, to Ireland, and from Ireland they sailed to America. Why? They didn't sail directly from Germany. They were taken out of Germany illegal because they were going to go to work for a foreign country that also was in many times they were crashing up with the English. First thing I have just to clarify, Germany didn't exist with the German states. So 
he had to bring all those Germans, there are seats here. They had to bring all those Germans to work here, and they had to be someplace to live. He bought all those houses. There were sometimes one-room houses for the ones that were single. They built double houses for families, two families in one house, because it was necessary to have headquarters for them also, storage for raw materials, and whatever it was needed to do the work here. Life and work in all Germany. It was a time, a period of time also in Germany, of too many internal wars. There was famine also during a period of time. And still the fight between Lutherans and Catholics was really strong. Lutherans were expelled from one place to another. Catholics were expelled from one place to another. We see that there are many things that are similar still today. So we don't learn from the mistakes we did in the past. This was a little town, the one on the right, that was the head that the Hassan level was born in Germany. And that was a typical house in the highlands. Because Hassan Clever came from Bergenland. And Bergenland are the highlands. So he came practically feeling home when he arrived here, because it was full of lakes. My wife and I, we have been, had the opportunity to visit the town where he was born, and we met with family members there, of the Hassan Clever family, and they showed us around. It looks like it was made for highlands, <laughs> really beautiful. And this was a typical iron furnace in the bottom of that time in Germany, in the 1760s. It's interesting to see about, I mentioned about St. Joseph Church. Hassan Kleber himself was Lutheran, but many of the workers, I would say 80 or 90% that he brought, were all Catholics. Because the area where the Irish works were in Germany at that time, they were mainly Catholics. <coughs> So they came to America, they were living in Germany, of the German state, their homes, and it was not easy to say goodbye. As you see, everything is black and white, you will not see any color stripe anymore because there was no photography. So I try always to find as much as possible black and white engravings, paintings like this ones. So, and they came all indented. So they had to pay back their transportation. It was not that they could just come and, okay, we invited you to come, and so you work here, you are very happy. No, no, no. It was not as easy as that. All indented, inclusive. Some of them, uh, they were here already working, and they tried to escape, and it was a different newspapers about uh, they were leaving, and please, we are... Uh, with so much money so that you bring him back because he is in debt with us, etc. And very common also that we can register with Hassan Clever one of the first labor strikes in New Jersey because they had the strike demanding more money because he wanted, they wanted more money. <laughs> okay. They came in little boats, the 550. Unfortunately, we don't have any records of their names because they were taken illegally out of Germany. There have been historians in Germany already searching, and they found some of them based on Father Farmer's records in Philadelphia. So we know most probably that they came through Philadelphia, not New York. Father Farmer was a priest there, a Catholic priest in Philadelphia, and he was the one who came once a year 
five course to West Milford for baptism, marriages, and trying to maintain their faith. And you will see that a little further in one of my slides. So living in those ships was not the most common thing. Sometimes they were there for weeks because it, take, it took seven to eight weeks to, to come to America from England. They, they had to bring their own food and water. They didn't get anything on, on board. There was no uh, room service. They had to bring everything on board. And occasionally, depending on the weather, they were able to go and have some fresh air on deck. Okay, they arrived. They arrived at some of the ports, and we know if they arrived in Philadelphia, most probably. So they had to start settling down and to establish some headquarters. Of course, at the beginning, they had something like this, just a little shed, a little roof, so that they could stay there. It was nothing fancy, nothing special, but that was the way they had to do. So our ancestors really didn't have it very easy here in West Milford or in any place in America. We know that also from other places that with the um, pilgrims or the other um, people came here to America, they, were, they didn't have an easy life, at least not at the beginning. The relationship with the Native Americans, reading Hassan Gerber's biography, these are some of the books I use, some of them. But reading Hassan Kleber's biography, he said that the Native Americans here, they were really peaceful and good neighbors. So we can estimate that the relationship was not bad. And also, <coughs> it, it's based on studies by other historians that the Lenny Lena PC and the area were really peaceful people. On the right, you see the typical pilgrim outfit. But we don't believe that that was the outfit that they had. Searching around, I will show you what we estimate were what they really were wearing. They had then to establish and make the, the living quarters. Most of the houses at the beginning were only log houses. And many times was just one room. There was not more than one room, just with a fireplace that was to heat in the winter, to cook, and to uh, keep the house warm. Later on, they built a second floor, or they had maybe just a loft as a sleep quarters. So it was, they were small units. But based on the description of Hudson Clever in this book, some of the houses were larger, mainly at the, in the 68, 69, 70s, before he went back, there were larger houses, and they were all in the middle of the forest. They had to start from cutting the trees, everything, there was no longer jar, everything has to be done, all done by them. One of the Germans that came also was smart enough, Mr. Hudson Clever, to request carpenters. So he had carpenters that came over to help. Clothing. I have a book that show the Germans, <coughs> I would not say Germans, the people from southern uh, Germany, southern states, close to Bavaria and to Austria, that they were going north to colonize um, East Prussia, at that time was Prussia, the king of Prussia, by Frederick the Great. In 1732, they went north, and that's from that book I was able to find those uh, type of clothing they were using. The whole uh, wood shoes and the type of hats and other shoes and other that they were wearing. 1732, why I have that? My father, ancestors, were in that group that went from Salzburg into Prussia. That's the reason I have the book. 
So I believe that's the best way to demonstrate the type of clothing that those Germans were wearing here during Peter Hassinger's time in America. Kitchen. We go to some of the pictures, and like this one, that I got also from the cook, uh, book of colonial time. Everything is beautiful, they have everything, and so, but honestly, I don't believe it was as easy as that. And normally, everything was the big nut stoves, everything was done in the fireplace. And I actually may believe that the one on the left, it's a more pe better representation of the way a kitchen was. And kitchen was at the same time also the dining room. <coughs> Here you see what I mean, the all purpose room, because it was one room. There was the kitchen by the fireplace, but they had a little table on the left where they were having the dinner. And then also on the right they had those, uh, those are typical pilgrims outfits that they were sitting down in the evening when the people came back from work and that whole back is uncovered on the side is just to protect them and have it warmer during the winter time. It was also the old purpose room, the table, the big table that normally sometimes they have. It was like in the left for reading. The only book that they had at that time was the Bible. That's what they were normally reading by night. Or it was also used, uh, the old purpose room, to chat, have some guests, the neighbors, because many of the things that they were using and consuming they were really going changing from hand to hand. Okay, I have one extra hand, can I have a, a, a bucket of uh, flour or something? That was the way normally they were trading. <coughs> the fourth room was also the laundry. It was used to take a bath. It was also to make candles, ironing, um, spinning, they, at that time they didn't have cotton, they had wool or linen made out of flax. Hudson Kedro was also very, very much interested in flax, hemp and madder. He brought all the expertise into this area, but he was not doing it in this area. Some of the Germans that he had took him, they took him to Air Herkima County in uh, New York by the Mohawk River, and they established there some plantations for hemp, flax, and madder. So really, the old purpose room is like today in the high school, no? Sometimes on some schools they have it as for lunch, they have it also for sports, for special events. That was practically an old purpose room at that time. Sleeping quarters. <coughs> at the beginning they were sleeping all in the main room maybe they had only a lock where they were able to have a bed but when they started building a two level houses normally they had one big room or two rooms when they had two rooms maybe that's what they were used one for mom and the girls and one for dad and the boys that was the way that was. And they had different types of beds. They have like the one on the left, that's a typical court bed, that they have cords in the bottom, and they had always to start uh, stretching them, like with the two similar like this. Or sometimes in order to save some time, they were using beds that they put in a corner because so they were able to put it against the wall and have a better support. And on the bottom, on the right side, that's a bed warmer. They put normally in the winter because 
the heat that it came up completely from the fireplace in the first floor, they had to warm the beds, they put some the charcoal there that was already uh, burning, and so they put the temporary in this so the bed just to, to keep it warm. Outhouse. <laughs> of course, there was no bathrooms. There were no bathrooms. I mentioned at the beginning there was no tap water either. So they had, <coughs> and they had the boat. There were different ways. I don't go into many more details on this, <laughs> but you can see that and you know exactly what it is. Some people actually had outhouses with three seats. Oh, okay. oh yes. <laughs> What they were eating. They didn't brought a couple of things from Europe. But many of the things that were consuming here, the, the vegetables, the crops, were local. They had different types of berries, different types of vegetables, like one typical from here, the squash, the corn, but they brought wheat and rice from Europe. And believe it or not, Potatoes and tomatoes. They are from America originally. Tomatoes from Mexico and Central America and potatoes from Peru. But they didn't come from there to here. They went to Europe. They were adopted by the Europeans. And the one who brought the potatoes to America and North America were the French and the Italians brought the tomatoes. And very important also at that time were the different type of herbs. Herbs were also used for medicine and for flavor. And many times the flavor of the herbs was not used for a nice flavor of the herb. It's to hide the rough flavor of some of the food that was spoiled. That was one of the reasons they were using herbs and for medicinal purposes only. <coughs> Those animals didn't exist here. We didn't have cows, sheep, horses. They were all imported. And Hassan Clever was able to buy in the first two years, hundreds of horses and cows and bulls in order to maintain the, um, the communities operating. Of course we know that the turkey is from here, <coughs> and they started a house on the right side, that would be considered a double house, a, stone, a double house, but, no, excuse me, it's not a double house because it has no two chimneys and two doors. That's a big house with a one family house, most probably. Sorry. And animals, they try not to kill the animals with exception maybe of swine, because they didn't want it to, they needed the horses, they needed the cows for milk, and for um, making cheese, that was one of also important uh, foods that they were consuming. So much of the thing, uh, was meat that they got was to hunting and fishing, the deer, and of course the famous turkeys. No electricity, no refrigeration. So how did they preserve their food? There were different ways to preserve. One was like this, salting and drying for aeration and putting them in salt boxes or smoking the fishes or the meat also. Smoking was like they had in one of those houses. 
or ice houses. They would cut the ice in the winter and bring them into, into ice houses. At Long Pond there are two ice houses and one record I have been able to read, not from uh, Hassan Jaber, from another place in Pennsylvania, that they were able to harvest ice until March and the warehouses, the ice houses were so well built that they, sometimes they had ice until August during the summer. So they were able, and then they had a house like this one for the ice. Then sometimes if they had a small creek with a little, um, or a little uh, stream coming down from a source. They put the water here on the in a little pond inside the room to keep their food fresh. Or through smoking like the one on the right. This was a different type of food preservation they normally use. Children. Children were always a very important part of the community. Very, very important part of the community. They have to help at home. They have to study. And they have also some time to play. But many of the little boys and girls that come to Long from the Red gives occasionally uh, tours to schools when they say they didn't have time to play. Yes, they play. Simple games. Of course, no computers, no video games. <laughs> but, and we didn't have, tech, they didn't have uh, iPhones or smartphones or anything. So it was a very important part of the community. Normally early in the morning, they had to go, boys, to pick up firewood and eggs. Mm? And, eggs. and eggs to start fire. And the girls had to go to the creek or to the pond and bring the water. That was a very common thing also that they had to do. And during the day, they had to learn. During the time frame that I'm talking to you, there was no school. Practically, they were going to one of the family's homes, and that's where they were learning. And what they were learning was practically just to read and write, and maybe some multiplication, addition, uh, subtraction, and that was they had to learn. More not, it was only to survive. And many of them, they didn't really have to, they willing to, to, to learn something like that, so immediately they put them to work. They had to work also helping father, like cutting the wood, or um, uh, shaving the sheep, or washing clothing, or helping on the left mom in the kitchen. They, all of them they had to help. When they came practically to 12 years age, at that time, practically they had to go and start what they name it in Germany, learning, apprentice. They had to start learning what their father and mother was doing, and they had to be doing and working already with 12 years of age. Schooling. They were using normally the fever. That's in German. The little booklet where they practically they learned was the alphabet and basic words and they were using also to write what we, what they we, we can still buy them in the toy stores, not toys of us, but we can still get them, just like, or they name the forms, what was the name? I forgot the name. Mm -hmm. The dumb Was it English they were being taught? 
the horn book. The one that not here, they were not learning English because they were practically all Germans in the area. At, at least not in the first time frame of their four years that I'm talking when they arrived. They, they, they were not learning English. And as you see on the picture on the right, that's practically a home they were learning there with one of the ladies that most probably she was well educated. And they didn't went to college here. They had to go to high school. They didn't have that. It was up to fourth grade maximum. And that was what they had. And no geography, no history. But the practically they had to learn this about what to do to continue living and surviving. And they had some games, simple ones, like little bowling, making dolls. The youngsters that come to Long on occasion, they ask me what they were playing. And we have some of the games there that we show them. And they start playing with them. They say, oh, it's nice, it's really, I like it. <laughs> and the thing is, we got spoiled today, starting with us. So there are simple ways to entertain yourself. One of the good things is here our library also. Our library is very nice that we have it. Because many people say, well, what do we have a library? If we have a book, if we have a computer, we can see everything in the computer. But that's not the case. And just as a little side uh, commentary, when I talk to the kids and I says, never stop learning. I says, how? I says, continue learning every day. Every day you can learn. I am so, so many years old. And still today, every day I try to learn something new. And we try also, I try, my wife also, we are always trying to read as much as we can and get an interest in everything. Spiritual life. I mentioned to you about the first comments that came all from Germany. They were practically healed with, there was no church, there was no priest or pastor. What we normally had was only Father Farmer, Ferdinand Farmer, <coughs> but his original name was Steinmeier. He was German and came all the way once, sometimes twice a year. And his records in Philadelphia are the ones that have helped a lot to find the origins of some of the families that came. Because as I mentioned to you, there are no records officially of when they arrived or when they left Germany. There are no <coughs> records of that. An historian in uh, Germany found some of the ideas based on, uh, of the names based on Father Record, uh, Father Farmer records, but that was all. And in England, they tried to look to see when they left England coming to America, nobody was able to find still today the names or really the town of origin. Some of them today they have found it through genealogy studies. And one here lady in West Midford, uh, Susan Dix from the London Iron Works, she has been working very hard on that. But that's the maximum what we have been able to find. I found recently in a little book here named Diary of an Early American Boy, this Eric Sloan found a book, a little manuscript, a little booklet written by a young boy it was his diary. Today we did this, today we did that. And then he started putting ideas together, what he was trying to say within his little diary, what we did every day. And he prepared 
this room how it was when they started, when they arrived, and the first constructions that they had. Interesting here that I have to see there was here the solid, this the boarding room. It was on the other side, in the main building, it was to get the heat directly into this, because that's where they had normally the little baby after he was born to be in a warm area also. And later on, that was 1790, and in 1805, that's the way it looked. Most probably something similar happened here also in West Milford, mm -hmm. that we had some very random placed houses and buildings, and at the end it became really more than that, like those two communities at Longbourn and at Charlottenburg. But why were they here? Why they came to this area? Because I mentioned before, they were running out of woods in England to produce iron. They were importing iron, and they had possibility to make iron here, and Hassenkleder got the permit from the British government to establish iron woods. And we know why iron and steel is so important. Tools construction material. And this was the type of material they were using at that time. Today we use it for automobiles, for constructions, for ships, etc. So it's important that the consumption of steel today. It's one of the ways to measure how important industry a country has. But at that time was practically to survive because there was no iron here. The Indians didn't have iron. They had only wooden and stone tools. That was one of the reasons that they were practically <coughs> put on the side later on because they didn't have how to defend themselves. So Hassan Kleber came here to make iron. But how was iron made? Because that was where they were working. The people here came to work in the iron works. Of course, they had the carpenters to make the houses. There were the people that were to make the charcoal. But it was to make iron. That was the main business. And the picture on the left is a typical little furnace, most probably very similar to the one we had here at Charlottenburg at the long one. And the little drawing up is what you need to make iron. You take iron ore, iron ore is an iron oxide with impurities, so you have to smelt it to take out the iron, eliminate the impurities, and for that you need large quantities of charcoal, iron ore, limestone, also to go to rack, and you high temperatures over 2000 degrees in order to get the metal iron out. And the interesting thing is here, the gases, and I will mention it later, it was carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, and we know about carbon monoxide, and just many of the wars had also sulfur, so they were <coughs> um, uh, breathing sulfur oxides, toxic material. The lifespan of that time was very short. And important here is the water mill. Not having electricity, the only way they could have power to operate the furnaces or the hammers in the, um, in the forges was with water mills. Iron can be present in different type of ores, different type of oxides. The one that we have here is magnetite, because it's attracted by a magnet. And important thing 
is that it's one of the purest of all the ores, the magnetite, has higher content of iron. Mm -hmm. Famous mines around here, okay, the most famous is the Peters mine in Greenwood. That was one of the sources of iron for long time. And there were other smaller ones around here, like in Sterling, there was also one in um, the Seven Lakes Park in uh, New York. But inclusive there is a, one that is named Hasselzeber Mine. And Peter's Mine in Greenwood is for Peter Hasselzeber. There, there are different types of uh, mining ways. One was diving in the surface, but normally here in this area they would make digging the tunnels and taking the iron ore from them. Charcoal was also very important and was needed to heat the furnaces because wood does not burn at very high temperature because it has impurities and still has moisture in it. So charcoal is like a type of cooking. Normally they cut the trees, put them to dry, and then they pile them up like there was in the picture there. We name it a charcoal pit. And once the wood is there, they cover it completely with mud and leaves to seal it completely. And in the middle, from the top, they make a little hole and they start burning it. Not having entrance of oxygen, practically it's like a low combustion without oxygen, just what is in the material, and producing the charcoal, eliminating all the resins, all the impurities, and the water, and ending at the end with charcoal that burns at much higher temperature. If you see pictures of the 1850s in the highlands, there were practically no woods anymore. All of them were gone because they started cutting and cutting. Today, when they have industry that still needs a lot of wood, what they do is they cut the trees, then they go to the next section and they start planting trees here. So when they finish at the other end, they these trees are taken up so to continue using them. And we saw that my wife and I went trip to the Czech Republic. We went into one of those places for construction. It was incredible the way they controlled the, the forest there in order not to run out of wood. Everything was done by hand, human force loading the furnace from the top like in the two left ones and the one here with the hand that was the iron master the iron master was the one who know how much charcoal to add how much um, limestone how much ore and depending on the smell and the color looking down he was able to see it's night time to tap the furnace. Tap the furnace, what's that? In the bottom of the furnace, there was a little hole here covered with clay. So they had to tap it, and then the liquid iron started coming out into little trenches like this, and this became then what is known as the pig iron, because it brings it looks similar to a saw with the little thick, let's see on the side, meeting, drinking, and more. And they had here also, when they had, when sometimes they had the iron in order to make pots and all the type of utensils that they needed. I mentioned to you about the water wheels, there was no electricity, so they had to use the water wheels to move and open and close the bellows to inject air. 
because large quantities of air was needed in order to elevate the temperature inside the furnace and they had normally or two bellows or two cylinders blowing air into the furnace in order to keep the temperature as high as the 2000 degrees that I mentioned to you before. It was a lot of work also to keep them operated, operating because the, the bellows were all made of leather. Now, the iron that comes out, <coughs> the thick iron, it's very hard but brittle. So it has still impurities. One of the ways to take it out is using forgers like this one and the hammers here on the right side in order to take all the impurities that were heating the thick iron and hammering it. And hammering it. And that way, all the impurities went out and they came with a much better iron in order later on, maybe, if needed, to convert it into steel. And thus, the hammers were all operated also by water wheels because they were very <coughs> heavy ones. And then they went to the blacksmith to make the tools that were needed, could be knives, could be axes, could be shovels, uh, horseshoes, nails for the construction, and those were typical tools, the typical tools here of the blacksmith and in the forges. But as I mentioned to you, it was not easy for them. Uh, it was normally 12 hour shifts, five or six days in the week that they had to be working there, based on records that we have from London. It was long shifts, and with all the high temperatures, not having protective gear, safety shoes, so that maybe they had just an apron, that's what they had a leather apron, no gas masks. So it was really that not everything went well when they had to come back home. I have here some of the books I used to write this. I not only to do this is books I have been reading in order trying to learn more about history, about making iron. This is part of what I have, and if you want to look here at my books also, you're more than welcome. This is one that I discovered lately at the Westminster Museum. It was a donation that we got from one of our um, uh, neighbors here in town, and when I saw it, it's fantastic. We gave me an idea. And something I learned from that and I forgot to mention. How do we know what they had at that time in their houses? There are no records, no insurance uh, list of whatever they had. How do we know what they had at home? Pots, knives, utensils, um, anything. The wheels. Normally they had to put everything in the will when they were going. And they listed in the wills what they had. So I learned it from there that that was on the way that historians know that, okay, in this area normally they had this, this and that based on the wills. Thank you.